For my 100th episode, I decided to come out on location for the first time to look at an infamous case in Welsh history. Anyone who knows me will know that this case is the one that really sticks with me, especially as I only live about five miles in that direction. I'm here in Clidach near Swansea to look at the Clidach murders. What happened? What was the aftermath? And also to look at why people are still talking about it 25 years later. I'm still talking about it and that's because this case still really boils my piss. Why? because I find it so hard to believe there was not reasonable doubt on the basis of the evidence presented. As our very handsome roving reporter has said, for the the 100th episode of Murder of Crows, we're looking at arguably the most controversial case in Welsh history that of the 1999 Clidach murders. This is Murder of Crows. arrived on Kelvin Road in Clidach and just across the road behind me is number nine where on the 27th of June 1999 three generations of one family were bludgeoned to death leaving four people including two young children dead. Not only that the perpetrator set several fires in the property in a bid to destroy evidence. I will be looking at the case, but it's important to remember that there were four innocent victims here. No amount of talking about this case will change that. So as angry as I may get over the course of this episode, please be in no doubt that I am fully aware that there were innocent victims that were senselessly killed in this case. My upset is what with what came after the abhorrent murders, starting with an on-call senior investigating officer who spent less than 10 minutes on the crime scene and onward through the investigation and subsequent legal proceedings. So as we delve deeper into the case, always remember the four victims that were so cruelly killed in this very street. In terms of the facts of what happened on the 27th of June 1999, the facts are quite simple and I will lay them out now. But I will then need to introduce you to the main players before I can explain why certain aspects of the investigation and the trial were perhaps a little off. Hopefully when I've laid everything out you may understand why this case still bothers me and why it is so hard to believe that any jury in full possession of all the facts 
cannot have had reasonable doubt. On June the 27th, 1999, a raging house fire in Clidach awakened some of those living in the small valley town. No one knew how the fire started. Neighbours were eager to put the fire out but were unable to do so. Then the fire services arrived and a firefighter brought out the first occupant, the body of a young woman. Only later did anyone realise that the burning house was a murder scene. A family of four living in Clidach, 34-year-old Mandy Power, her 80-year-old invalid mother Doris Dawson and Mandy's two daughters Katie aged 10 and Emily aged 8 were brutally beaten to death by an attacker wielding a four-foot fibreglass pole. Mandy Power had a sex toy inserted into her, most likely post-mortem, indicating a specific targeting of her and a level of rage directed at her. The murders shocked the entire country. It was a horrific tragedy and four people including two young children were senselessly and brutally murdered. Obviously the nature of the crimes and the overwhelming public outrage meant that these murders needed to be solved. But before I look at the investigation I need to look at the major players. Since their behaviour before and after the murders changes the perception of certain things that happened. So we have Mandy Power herself and after divorce from her husband Michael Power the mother of two had led an interesting complex and unconventional social life including a series of affairs with men. The former nursing home care assistant who lived with her bedridden mother then started a relationship with a former policewoman named Alison Lewis. So naturally now we come on to Alison Lewis. Alison Lewis was a former Welsh women's rugby international and black belt in karate and she gave up her job as a policewoman due to health problems. This mother of twin girls apparently led a double life, had affairs and hid her sexuality from her husband. And she saw a solicitor about leaving her husband and had hoped to move in with Mandy Power. Now we come on to David Morris. He was a man who was born and bred in Swansea and this divorced father of three was, as everybody will attest to, no angel. His girlfriend Mandy Jewell was close friends with Mandy Power and it was claimed that he both hated and lusted after Mandy Power with Di Morris claiming to have had an affair with Mandy Power himself. Then we have Sergeant Stephen Lewis who was the husband of Alison Lewis and as we know she was in a sexual relationship with Mandy Power. Stephen Lewis was known to have made threats against Mandy Power in the weeks before the murders because of her affair with his wife Alison. 
And Stephen Lewis would later go on to give evidence at the trial that would follow. Stuart Lewis was the identical twin brother of Stephen Lewis and Stuart Lewis was a senior detective with the South Wales Police. In fact, both Lewis brothers were inspectors in the South Wales Police. Now, I also want to mention David Hutchinson, and he only really becomes relevant dur during the legal proceedings, but there are concerns around his fitness to represent David Morris as he did at trial, because this solicitor represented Stephen and Stuart Lewis when they were arrested and in their subsequent complaint against the police. But he went on to represent David Morris, who claimed that Hutchison's relationship with the Lewis brothers created a conflict of interest, which Mr. Hutchison denied. But I don't see how you can go from representing two of the main alternative suspects and then representing another suspect. So with our major players identified, going back to the night of the murders, when firefighters discovered the true nature of the scene, it was obviously declared a major crime scene. And as such, an on-call senior detective would be required until, until the case was allocated to a specific team. On the night of the murders, this on-call senior investigating officer was Stuart Lewis, the identical twin brother of the man who had made threats to Mandy Power and whose sister-in-law Alison was having an ongoing relationship with Mandy Power. Stuart Lewis stayed on the crime scene for only eight minutes after which he disappeared. He later turned up back at the police station and instead of using his mobile phone to make calls, he proceeded to use the payphone in the lobby to make calls instead of remaining on the crime scene to properly secure the scene and manage the early investigation. In fact, firefighters on scene were confused by the poor management of the scene and the lack of a senior officer on site. It took about three weeks to conclude the murder investigation at the house, the longest ever seen in Wales. Detective Inspector Martin Lloyd Evans of the South Wales Police was the senior officer in charge of the case. He told journalists that there was no trace of evidence, and this included DNA and or fingerprints, found at the crime scene. He claimed that the killer must have erased all traces of their presence. Although it should be pointed out at this stage that DNA of Alison Lewis was found on Mandy Power's thigh. This is relevant because Mandy had psoriasis and showered very, very regularly, meaning that the DNA on her thigh must have been very fresh. Uh, that means within hours of the murder happening. After 21 months of investigative work, the police approached David George Morris, also known as Di, on the 20th of March 2001. Now, Di Morris was a 38-year-old builder's labourer and he was known to be unpopular in Craighaven Park, the village where he lived. Years earlier, during the 1980s, Morris had racked up many convictions which remained on his record. He had stolen cars, carried out a robbery, and committed other crimes, one of which cost him five years in prison. 
It was also reported that his first wife, Wendy, divorced him because he had used violence against her, although this has been denied. Di Morris had enjoyed a sexual affair with one of the murder victims, that being Mandy Power, but initially he lied to the police that such a relationship occurred because he did not want his current girlfriend to find out because his girlfriend at the time, Mandy Jewell, was close friends with Mandy Power. On the night of the murder, he claimed that he went from the pub and returned home to a home he shared with his girlfriend, which means he had no confirmed alibi for the time of the murders. Crucially, a gold necklace covered in blood was found at the crime, spe crime scene, and it was found at the spot where the greatest violence was believed to have taken place. Morris claimed that he had left the chain in Mandy's home when he went there on the Friday before the murders to have a sexual encounter with her. We will return to this later, but David Morris was charged with the murders. The 11-week trial in 2002 was told that Di Morris had inflicted appalling injuries on Mandy Power after she rejected his sexual advances. According to the prosecution, having consumed eight pints of strong lager as well as taken amphetamines, he had gone to her house and attacked the 34-year-old divorcee before bludgeoning her daughters Katie aged 10 and Emily aged 8, then attacking grandmother Doris Dawson aged 80 in her bed. They were, according to Mr Justice Butterfield, horrific murders committed with great savagery on four defenceless victims. And this is one aspect of the court proceedings I can agree with. But suspicions did fall on the Lewises, Alison Lewis, Stuart Lewis and Stephen Lewis. The court was told that Alison Lewis had been having an affair with the bisexual and sexually adventurous Mandy Power. Her, along with her husband, acting Inspector Stephen Lewis, and his brother, Inspector Stuart Lewis, the first senior officer at the crime scene, were originally arrested and questioned, but were released without charge after four days. The Lewis's solicitor in their case against the police was David Hutchison and he went on to represent Mr. Morris at trial. They argued, therefore, that his case was undermined by a serious conflict of interest, and it would be this that would lead to Di Morris getting an appeal in which his conviction was quashed and a new trial ordered. But in this new trial, an inexperienced barrister, usually dealing in corporate law, represented Di Morris and was very ineffectual, failing to cross-examine witnesses and make a compelling case for the defence, meaning that Di Morris was found guilty again. But the reason people are still talking about the case 25 years later are the issues with the case that cannot be resolved to public satisfaction. So I want to rewind now to go through several of the issues with the case that to my mind provide a considerable level of reasonable doubt. First let's go back to the night of the murders and go over to our very good looking and 
very single and ready to mingle ladies, roving reporter in Clidach. I am now on Vardra Road and it was on this road at 2.30 in the morning that a witness reported seeing two men walking together with the witness remarking how similar the men were to each other. Obviously I can't say who it definitely was or wasn't but it is worth remembering that the key alternative suspects in this case are a set of identical twins. I mean, it may have been two men who happened to share some similarities, but it's definitely something worth keeping in mind, I think. Another key location in the Clidach case is here on Gellionen Road, which is a long road leading from Clidach itself into the rural countryside. Nearer the town itself, a woman saw a stocky man in a bomber-style jacket carrying a bundle, and she worked to create an e-fit that's been widely reported on, along with thoughts on who it resembles. Further out towards the countryside, a taxi driver who hadn't come forward during the original investigation saw a man similarly dressed in a bomber-style jacket and carrying a bundle was seen illuminated by the taxi's headlights later at around 4.30am. Strange things were afoot here on Gretlionin Road. Behind me is the New Inn pub, where David Morris was drinking on the night in question. He was said to have had about eight pints of beer before leaving the pub at 11.30pm. It is about a 15 minute walk to Kelvin Road from here. Now crime scene analysis has told us that Doris was killed first in the horrific series of events that happened at 9 Kelvin Road. And we also know that Mandy and the children arrived home at 11.48pm. So how was David Morris meant to have walked from the pub to 9 Kelvin Road, bludgeoned Doris to death, then lain in wait quietly before Mandy entered the house at 11.50. The timing seems almost impossible. But now I'll drive us from here back to Kelvin Road to see what that sort of walk may look like. So after our little road trip in Clidach, now we need to look at crime scene analysis from the house in Kelvin Road. 
While analysis found that Doris was killed first, what is less well known is the fact that Doris was in full rigour when she was removed from the scene, while the other victims were not yet in rigour. This suggests that she was killed significantly earlier than the other victims. Moving the timeline for Di Morris to get to the home from improbable to impossible. With this in mind, it's worth bearing in mind that Doris actually has two death certificates. Because when pressure was brought to bear for the pathologist to change Doris' time of death from the originally estimated 7.30 pm to be similar to those of the other victims, by the time the pathologist caved and wanted to change the death certificate, the recent death certificates had been bought by Ancestry.com and released into the public domain. So a new death certificate was released instead. Hmm, do we find that dodgy? And in terms of the prosecution's smoking gun, the presence of Di Morris gold chain at the crime scene. When Di had gone to Mandy Power's home on the Friday before the murders for a sexual encounter, he gave the chain to Mandy as she said she could get it repaired, and it was seen on the day of the murders by Mandy's friend Louise Pugh, who said it was in a potpourri dish in Mandy's bedroom along with other bits and pieces of jewellery, so the chain was already there regardless of where Di Morris was, and the murder weapon a length of fibreglass pipe. Now this pipe was often played with by Mandy Power's daughters, and one day in the week shortly before the murders, M Mandy had asked a friend to put it out of the way to stop the children playing with it. This friend put it behind the shed, and when she turned around, the only person who had seen where she'd put it was Alison Lewis, who was watching her from inside the house. And on the subject of Alison Lewis, after the murder she was playing the part of the heartbroken girlfriend of Mandy Power, who was hoping for a future with her. But Alison Lewis had another ongoing lesbian affair at this time, so it was hardly the paradise she was portraying it as. Oh, and it was Alison Lewis who gave her husband Stephen an alibi, saying that they were in bed together on the night of the murders. But Alison and Stephen were living separate lives by this time, and were sleeping in separate beds. Can somebody help me have this make some sense? None of these things prove anything in and of themselves, but if taken together and presented to a jury, would and should have raised significant reasonable doubts, which then leads to the suggestions of ineffectual counsel in not one but two trials. The first significant, significantly hampered by a serious conflict of interests, with the defence solicitor having previously acted for two of the only other viable suspects in the case, then in the second trial the defence counsel was extremely inexperienced and failed in even the simplest cross-examinations, including when one alternative suspect explained that he was in possession of matches in order to light the stove. And the council, the defence council, failed to mention that the stove was electric. So here are my main issues with this case.
I cannot in all good conscience understand why a jury did not have reasonable doubt. And as such, this is why I really struggle to let go of this case. The ultimate tragedy is that David Morris collapsed and died of a heart attack at HMP Long Lartin on August the 20th, 2021, aged just 59. But his death did not signal the end of the fight to have his name cleared. A, face, a Facebook group supporting him, entitled David George Morris, currently has more than 30,000 members, and the struggle to clear his name goes on. Whatever your thoughts on Di Morris' guilt or innocence, I hope I've provided enough information to give people food for thought and make it hard to see how Morris could possibly have been convicted on this evidence with such significant holes in the case. I want to dedicate this video to the victims of the horrific crime. Doris Dawson aged 80, Mandy Power aged 34, Katie Power aged 10 and Emily Power aged 8. Regardless of the controversies and ongoing debate, these four innocents were horrifically killed and they should always be remembered, whatever our thoughts on this case. Thank you for watching another episode of Murder of Crows. I'm Steve. Samson is sunbathing over by the balcony. So while he's otherwise occupied, I will just say, I'm Steve, and I'll see you when I see you.